In this episode of Business Success with Graham and Leanne Carling, the couple are traveling to the Algarve, Portugal, to visit one of the most well-known businessmen and entrepreneurs in the UK. This man's business interests traverse hotels, health clubs, media, and property. The success of these various businesses culminated in earning him a chair on one of the most popular business shows on TV, Dragon's Den. This is, of course, Duncan Bannatyne. You are watching Business Success. Business Success is the program where Graham and Liang Carling discuss business with other industry leaders from around the world. Graham and Liang themselves building a group of companies through the strategy of company acquisition, which now has a multi-million pound group turnover and employs hundreds of people across the country. Today, they are meeting Duncan Bannatyne, who in regard to his business activities is likely to be best known for building and operating health clubs. Amongst other things, together they will be discussing the challenges faced by big businesses over the last three years and their approach to overcoming those challenges. Dunkey, delighted to be here. Thank you very much for having us in your beautiful home here in, in, in Portugal. Um, Leanne and I are really looking forward to attending the, the Codwell Children uh, Gala Dinner uh, down here tomorrow night. I'm sure uh, you and Nagora are looking forward to that uh, also. Absolutely, yeah. yes. We are what two and a half years in now, since almost since um, the first COVID lockdown. How's business for you now? Well, it's recovering, but it's recovering slowly. It's still not not the way it was in 2019. I'm just matching my revenue and profits 2019, and we won't make make as much this year as we did in 2019. I don't think we will next year either. So it's a slow climb back up again. A lot more expenses now. The, it's an hour, million and a half. And the cost of heating our swimming pools, for example, you know, and then uh, a million more in the new national insurance stamps and things like that, and interest in the money we borrowed <laughs> from the government. Mm -hmm. you know, so, <coughs> so it's tough, but we'll get there. Yeah, we go back to that March in 2020 when it was that was it. Everything was in, you know, the the country, if you like, was in lockdown. Yeah. I remember how we felt when, you know, that was it. Businesses stopped, right? Nobody leave the house. How was that for you? I mean, how did that feel? What was the well, you know, it was like a slow burner, wasn't it? Because we thought it was going to be a month. Mm -hmm. And then it was more. It was two months and it was more. And then we opened again. And then we closed again. Mm -hmm. And it got worse because we had to close clubs in Scotland, but not in England. Yep. And close them in Wales, but, you know, not in Scotland. And, and then close them in Northern Ireland, you know. And it's like so complicated mm -hmm. and uh, difficult. Uh, but like most people in business, entrepreneurs, we just get our heads down, get through these things mm -hmm. the best way we can. Yeah. And, uh, but it was not an easy time. But I say that, but there's a lot of people a lot less fortunate than us who are living in, in, in one bedroom and two bedroom apartments who didn't really have a garden. We were able to stay here and they walk along this beautiful golf course because nobody was playing golf yeah. <laughs> and spent some time there. Mm -hmm. They were still cutting the grass, but nobody was playing golf, so. Right. Yeah. I remember we were uh, our businesses, we had some mature businesses, some that we'd actually only started uh, or had got started only a few months earlier where there was a mad panic. I mean, what was it What was it like, you know, being in the, the, the leisure industry that you're in? Yeah, I mean, it, it slowly became apparent that we were, we were closing for longer than what we'd anticipated and, and that um, this is becoming very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the government did come in and we borrowed, with, with the loans, we borrowed £24 million pounds from the government right. and they got some grants and things. And eventually we had to do a deal with our landlords. Yeah. And so you have to give us a discount. Well, they all give us the same discount, the same percentage of the rent. Right. And they agreed, six months of negotiation, but they, they agreed yeah. in the end. Uh, so we survived. But the motions were, you know, you, you start to think, okay, so if we can't pay our debts and the company is in liquidation, what do we do next? Mm -hmm. You know, and these sort of things, we're, we're, we're thinking about how you would live after that. Yeah. You know, it could well have happened. And I, I think. Of the 10 biggest um, health club operators in the UK, six went into some sort of receivership, right. some in and back out the next day mm -hmm. and things like that. Yeah. 
Yeah. But, but you know, it wasn't easy. But in terms of as you come out of this, I mean, wh what did you see in terms of your team of people, the, the people, the leadership team, and and, and even the the, the 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 colleagues that were operating in the gyms and positives and the negatives, you know, going through that process during COVID. Well, the team were were were, were all behind us. Yeah. I mean, and, and they were all you know they took pay cuts, right. uh, things like that. Because uh, you know the people that are not on furlough or higher higher level level of pay, yeah. had to take a voluntary pay cut. And uh, we would have worked together, get the nose to the grindstone, and worked hard, mm -hmm. and got us through it. Mm -hmm. And as you've came through that and you come out the other sides, what was the lessons from that period that you're now applying to the, the company now and going forward? Do you see? Yeah. Well, we, we realise we have to be uh, a lot tighter on expenditure uh, because we can't afford to spend what we were spending on, on wages and, and, and everything else and rents and things. We've actually got rid of four clubs who were making losses or not doing very well. So four are closed at 72. And uh, we've looked very, very closely at the wage bills and things like that. And uh, you know, the people on the higher levels have not had a pay rise for three years. Right. Um, but they accept that. Yeah. You know, unlike a lot of uh, people in the UK who, through the unions, are, are going on strike and things like that to get more, more wages. Mm -hmm. I don't know how the country would survive if everybody got a 10 or 15% pay rise to match inflation just now, because mm -hmm. that get inflation going even faster. Yeah. And so it's very, very difficult for for people like that, and I can understand them. Um, so you don't let you complain because you know people are so much worse off than us. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's just a different attitude to how much we spend. In terms of the 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 business now outlook, are you still looking to grow, grow your clubs, or what, what's the what's the plans now? If we if we were approached with uh, a small club that was for sale, we'd we'd look at it. Mm. But generally, no. Uh, our, we're still in survival mode. We've still got to pay off. Uh, we still owe almost £20 million pounds to the government for the money we borrowed during the, the pandemic. Yeah. We've got to pay that back. Um, so we're just surviving getting through that, paying extra interest that we're paying on that money as well, mm -hmm. and extra national insurance stamps, um, which is all difficult for us. Mm -hmm. But we'll get through mm -hmm. and survive and probably come out as a better company, but in 2024, not 2022 or 2023. The, to get to the number of clubs that you got to, was that done organically or was it through acquisitions or what was it, a mixture? Well, I built the first 30 or 32, I think it was, and we bought the land and actually built them. So I designed them. Uh, and then um, Living Well Hotel Company put up their, they had a number of health clubs in the hotels and a number outside the hotels. They put their independent ones up for sale. Right. So I was bidding on that, I think it was 26 of them, and I bought them for 92 million. Right. 2006, I think it was. And they've bought, made a few acquisitions sin since then and built one or two more since then. Okay. We've got 72. We're, we're operating 68 now. Right, yeah. Okay. So, uh, and how did you finance that then at the time? I mean, that was a, was a, well, it seems that must have been a big deal at that time. Yeah, well, I, I, um, I, after I started building health clubs, I had the health club business and I was getting into the children's nursery business. And um, I bought a small hotel in Darlington that was derelict. Um, but I still had my public company, which is called the Care Homes. So we operated homes for the elderly. So I sold that in 1997, and then uh, I had the, the money then to start doing that. Right. And it was a few years later before I had to bring in the bank and get bank borrowing. Right. And then we, we, we fi financed the bank borrowing. Mm -hmm. Well, but I invested um, was it 20 odd million more money back into the businesses. Right. If we go back just during the COVID period, certainly what we found in, in, in our sector, which is you know the property and the building services sector, it was very difficult for certainly us, some of our companies, to borrow any money, uh, even with other schemes, whether it's Siebel's loans and um, uh, various other sort of government initiatives and grant funding. Uh, our businesses are mainly in Scotland. There was a real mixed bag between which companies actually you know, they sounded great in principle, but in actual fact, trying to actually get, obtain the funding proved difficult. How was it in, in the leisure sector? You know, leisure sector, was, leisure sector was very difficult because, you know, for, I'll give you an example. So we, we operate four hotels within this business and the Chancellor reduced the VAT on them to about 5%. But the health clubs, they kept the VAT at 20%. And then they gave loans to the health clubs. I didn't understand why they didn't reduce the VAT in the health clubs and lend more, less money to the health clubs. Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't know why they, they 
took the hotels and restaurants out separate from health clubs because mm -hmm. it's the same type of operation right. with the same difficulties. Mm -hmm. But that's what I did. And, and one one health club operator went to the wall and never opened again. Right. That was um, DW Sports, I think it was. Okay. So they could have saved some jobs there, I think, if they reduced the VAT. Right. Um, but it just wasn't easy. It, it was not an easy thing about it. You know, you're just going to other see no revenue. You're still paying rent to all your landlords. Yeah. Um, we're in some freeholds and, and, and some, some rentals. And you're still paying the extra bit of wages for the people that earn more than the 30,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Subscriptions and things. Yeah. And you just wake up every, every day and think, are we going to survive? What about survival? What about not survive? Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, but eventually you get there because yeah. entrepreneurs do that, don't they? We, we go through and we, we try and make things work. Yeah. Well, I think when we, yeah, sorry. Sorry, we, I, we, we, we were the same. So, and I always said, like, the, the kind of furlough is like life support, you know, so yeah. you're on life support at the moment, but when you remove that furlough and all these different loans, what effect yeah. is it going to have in your business? Have you seen that? Because we certainly have, you know, we've took, the government has gave you these schemes to help you, but now we are finding it difficult because we've maybe took these schemes to get different funding. Have you found? Somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the thing is with the furlough as well is, you know, people on furlough accrued the holidays. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we open now and they're entitled to 20 days accrued holidays plus the 25 they will get this year anyway. So that's 45 days holidays this year. Yeah. So we've got to cover that. I mean, it's, it's cost us more money in wages just to cover the holiday pay that they accrued during, during furlough. And then you opened and um, they were allowed to have a second job. Yep. Mm -hmm. So you'd get the staff back in before and they say, well, a certain percentage, 15%, 20%, I'm not coming back. Mm -hmm. Well, I've got another job, I like the other job better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Even if it's an Amazon, just in a warehouse. Yes, you know yes, I mean? we've mm -hmm. found that as well. And yeah, so you don't like, you got to then try and recruit, you know. Mm -hmm. and my, my spa therapist is, is well done. Um, I, I, I'm getting people wanting bookings. I don't have enough spa therapists yeah. to run the business. Yeah. But we're paying more and putting prices up. And, and, and but there's a lack of training as well because during the pandemic nobody was getting trained. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's, it's left a, a big hole in some quarters, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, you just plod through it every day, yeah. just try and get through it. Some of the things that the schemes that were the incentives that Liam was saying here. So you had you were able to you know defer HMRC uh, payments. We were able to uh, Siebel's loans possibly. Then when you, we came through that weathered that storm. You know, some of our businesses have said, right, okay, we need to refinance it now. But actual fact, what the what the some of the lenders are doing, they're, they're kind of holding that against you. They're saying, ah, well, we don't really like it because you've got, you know, there's been eight, you've got yeah. the time to pay orders with HMRC, or there's uh, well, see, not so much the Siebel's loans, but certainly on time to pay orders that were taken advantage of that were you were kind of instructed to do as yeah. the first port of call. So we've seen we've seen. Uh, that certainly affected some of our businesses that actually they don't like to look at that on the balance sheet or they're a bit ne some of the lenders are a bit nervous about that. Is that has that been something you've seen? Yeah, I, I, I tell you what, we've got a, bit of a little bit of a crisis coming now because our our loans are going to be paid off by the end of 2023. Right. So when we do our 22 accounts, you can't get your accounts signed off yeah. if you've got a loan that's got to be paid within a year yeah. and no facility to repay it. Yeah. We'll repay it from wherever you're coming in, we'll refinance it. Yeah. We know that's going to happen, but you can't send your, your accounts off like that. Yeah. So what do we do? Yeah. I haven't worked out yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking to the bank and the bank will either have to extend the loan yeah. or uh, I'll do something, I'll refinance before yeah. 2023. You can't wait till 2023. You can't wait till no. yeah. But as an entrepreneur, you'll be back <laughs> in your brains to find the solution. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, look at a good finance director yeah. and, and yeah. she'll work very hard on it and she'll, she'll make something work. Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. So, and, and this is a question that, that I've got. I mean, you've obviously uh, live abroad or live overseas. The bulk yeah. of your businesses in the UK still, Duncan, yeah. are they? Yeah. So how does that work for you? I mean, Leanne and I, we live abroad now. We know the challenges uh, yeah. with that. How does that, I mean, how do you manage that? How does it work? I, well, I, I discovered Zoom in a big way during the pandemic, yeah. as many people did. And, yeah. and I do it all by Zoom. And we've got structured meetings and meeting dates. Yeah. You know, every yeah. week, uh, like Monday is the day I work. Right. You know, and I, I, I do my uh, meeting with my directors and then my regional managers, you know, every Monday. And in between, I've got other, other people I, I speak to 
and have an hour on the, on, uh, on the gym court at a time. Yeah. Yeah. And that seems to work. It seems to run a little bit better when I'm not there, actually. <laughs> <laughs> what about that? Let's do that about Graham. <laughs> but it's him, yeah. So you run better when you're not there. Yeah, Graham, stay, yeah, stay away. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, in terms of the team of people then, your board, your, the structure, um, because that's, that's dead interesting for us. We rely heavily on our guys on the ground. Yeah. And, um, we were a huge reliance on them. We've got a good team. We've we've seen. Um, I think through COVID. Yeah. Uh, um, sorry, but in no, no, you're right. I think through COVID, um, certain members of of our team really stepped up to the plate and they showed their, you know, I mean, yeah. I mean, ninety percent of them did, you know, but yeah. um, there was certain ones that just really um, raised the bar and yeah. performed really well. So we're thankful for that. Yeah. And that's been a, one of the challenges for us over the certainly since a lot for over the last eighteen months, and. Um, where you know you feel the need that you physically got to be there and driving it forward, yeah. but in actual fact, I think you know we 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 are certainly feeling a better structure now. We're bored in our team. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong. It, you know it, you've got to keep the momentum going and keep the keep the structure going and and keep, keep you know keep keep the, the keep the whole thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. keep the vision, setting the vision and yeah. and all that. Uh, that never stops. But certainly right through COVID, we've never worked harder. You know we've never worked. I mean we've worked the whole lot anyway. 24 7 and we've managed to find a team of people that are like us <laughs> similar yeah. to us now that's taken a while but um but it is you know what you, you know you said earlier on um before we came on you know the golden nugget is you've got to just roll your sleeves up and work hard yeah absolutely and uh, yeah i find i've got some great regional managers i've got eight regional managers who manage the clubs and manage the operations of the clubs and they're doing fantastic jobs um and they're doing jobs that i couldn't do I couldn't keep all these, they've got, say, 10 clubs under them and keep the information in all those clubs and what's happening in all those clubs and then focus on that every time they go and visit those clubs. But they, they, they seem to do it and they seem to be good at it. Mm -hmm. you get the right people have got to be slotted yeah. in the correct place. Yeah. 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 I think that, that's yeah. something that we found over the years, you know, not just through yeah. COVID, is having the right team around you. Oh, yeah. And advisors, you know, professionals, yeah. lawyers, mm -hmm. accountants, etc., just to, to help you on your, your journey because we've learn lessons the hard way, you know, costly lessons by having the wrong people. What's, what, what is it, is there an end for you, Duncan? Is there an exit here planned or what's the, what no, how does it look? No, my exit's day I die. Right, yeah. So sell yeah. the business that I yep. die and that's it. Yeah. 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 Love that. And I totally understand that. People say to us, you know, when are you going to retire? I say, no chance. <laughs> no chance. No yep. chance of retiring. Why would you? Yeah, yeah why would yeah. you do that? Yeah. Um, so I think when we, when, when we're looking at it, we're talking to the many people that we've spoken to on these uh, uh, shows has been everybody's the same they say we're all the same you know everybody's yeah. the same. Well, you know there's and we just keep going at it you know we're, we're, we're d if you like in the trenches every day uh, yeah. and all that we're in the sort of building services business we own uh, our businesses as a residential property with some commercial student accommodation and building services um, but you seem to have been I mean you're in the leisure industry but you've been very much involved in building developments and, and building buildings and yeah. design and all that stuff is that something you you know you you you're, you enjoy doing is that yeah i mean it started when i went into the, the elderly and, and most people converted buildings and it was like three or four in a room mm -hmm. and i wanted all single bedrooms yeah and i found the only way you could do that was to buy some land and build a place mm -hmm. i found a plot of land actually i was in my ice cream van in stockton high street i packed my ice cream van i was walking down the high street i saw this plot of land for sale and i bought it mm -hmm. took a bit of time and then I built a home for the, elder, for, for the elderly, all 30 single bedrooms. Yep. And it was quite unusual and it, was, it filled the next day because people moved from where, where there were six in a bedroom to get a single bedroom. The price was the same because it was paid for by the state, the government. Yeah. And so I then built another one, another one kept building. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that company, I did the same with the health clubs. Right. And I, I, so I sat down and I said to the architect, I said, you know, there's too much corridor space. I want to reduce. And eventually we came to a, a figure of 18% maximum corridor space. Right. And they designed it and um, it worked. Yeah. You know, if you've got a big open corridor space, you're heating that corridor space. You know I mean, mm. yeah. you don't often need it. Yeah. yeah. So in terms of actually doing the development, I mean, is it, do you manage, what was it, you were managing the contractor side of it or, you, uh, or were you involved ever in that? No, it'd be a fixed price contract with a contractor. Right. And that would yeah. be it. And, yeah. I, and, and I had a really good um, property director at the time. Right. Who was very good. Some property people are very good at, at overseeing a new build and some managing how your air condition works in 70 clubs. 
It's yeah. a different skill I found. Yeah. So, so he was very good at, the, at that business at the time. Right. And he was good. He'd bring everything in and say the budget. Mm -hmm. It was great. Yeah, and uh, so we'd build one, then build another one. Yeah. So eight one year was the best year, I think. But eight, what was that? The, the Kid homes or no, eight health clubs. Eight health clubs. Oh, yeah, okay. I think it was in 2001 we built it. Right, okay. So Duncan, obviously a very successful businessman. Yeah. You know, what, what is it? What, what do you say has been you know, one of the main reasons for your success? I think, I think the tips of it is, is that don't think there's any shortcuts because there isn't. <laughs> yeah. uh, work very hard, mm -hmm. work long hours, mm -hmm. and be dedicated because you know, anyone can do it. I mm -hmm. um, just really go for it. And uh, just as, as you build the company, you, you have to build up good people around you. And there's some great people who just want to be in, 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 in management and don't want to start their own business, mm -hmm. you know. And they understand that you've started the business, but they're, they're back in the business. Um, and, and, and that's it really, you can be a little bit arrogant by, by believing in yourself mm -hmm. very, very much. Mm -hmm. And uh, that helps. Yeah. I'm often accused of being arrogant, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing that well. <laughs> and if, if there was a message to your younger self, what would it be? To your younger self, I would say, well, have the confidence in yourself much earlier, because I was in my 30s when I started business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was penniless at the age of 30. Uh, I didn't even have a bank account when I was 29. So I'd say, you know, s be confident in yourself much more quicker mm -hmm. in life, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'd have left school at 15 and Started in business if I, if I went back over it again. Yeah, yeah. Be more mm. confidence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we see exactly the same. I mean, we tell our kids and our children as well, you know, what, what's, what we should have failed faster. You know, we should have got in the game earlier, we should have failed faster, yeah. get out of the road because there will be failings and um, uh, and all that stuff. But and our son, who's he's, he's, he'll be 15 this year, we can, that's what one of the things we say to him, encourage him, look, you know, because it took us, you know, it took me until I think it was you know, 29, 30, or something yeah, like yeah, to really yeah. start. Start to uh, and and had a couple, you know. That's how you handle failures. Fails. I mean, what have you? What failures have you? Is there anything there that have given you the biggest lessons in terms of failings? We opened one children's day nursery which failed miserably, uh, and uh, we couldn't fill it because we, we built up a children's day nursery business over five years and then sold it. Um, it was just in the wrong location, right? So double check your location and things. That's part of the business. Um, but we made a mistake on one. And I also uh, tried to take over um, a small public company, which is called Lady and Leisure. And I started buying up the shares. And I uh, spent a million pounds on the shares, and they went bust. So I lost a million pounds overnight. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a bit of a lesson. Yeah. You know, stayed away from buying public company shares after that. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we got way too emotional with the business. You know, we got too attached yeah, to it. Yeah. And it feels like, you know, we're saying, and. Then you're, you know, you're, you're trying you're to keep it going. You're, you're, you're bet when you know, yeah. you know, your mind's telling you one thing. Look, it's clear, yeah. but uh, you know, you get too, you you know, you get too close to these you, the people that you're working with. And yeah. Have you? I mean, how, well, how have well, you dealt with that before? I went into business because I wanted to have some money to buy a house and uh, put my children through school, and that was it. I was never, never dreams of having a huge business. And I would say this: I enjoyed it. I loved it, mm -hmm. and you should do what you love. Yeah. And if you don't love being in business, then you shouldn't do it. Yeah. You know, and uh, I mean, I've got, uh, I travel with some great, great, great guys who are plastic surgeons. And every year I try to fund a mission and we, we repair clefts in children. So we do like uh, 50, yeah. 250 clefts in, in a mission in, in Mexico or somewhere. And all these guys love what they do. And they love the plastic surgery. But they say, they all say, we can make so much money doing beautiful women and changing them, doing the breasts, doing the faces, doing things like that. And the husband will just pay whatever they have to pay. He says, but we'll come here, he says, we don't get paid for it. He says, we're in not very nice hotels, we live here, and we we'll love every minute of it because we change the lives of 250 yeah. children and the families. Yeah. You know yeah. I mean? So if they could do that every day, they'd probably do it every day, but they can't do it every day. Yeah. They can't make a living. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, you know, you've got to enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. If you enjoy, if you enjoy your business, you enjoy life. Yeah. And in terms of, uh, uh, you touched on there, I mean, the, the, the what you do for ch charity and philanthropy and that's something that you're, you're, you seem to be very big into and uh, how important is that to you, Duncan? Well, I made a decision um, probably 20 years or more ago that I wasn't going to just give money to charity if I didn't understand the charity. Mm -hmm. You don't just salve your conscience by sending cheques for yeah. tens or 50,000 or whatever time. I wanted to know that what the charity did. So I got very involved with UNICEF and worked with them for a while. 
and I got involved with um, great charity, Scottish International Relief, mm. who then started Mary's Meals. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. yep. And uh, they're, they're feeding about 1.2 million people all around the world now, children in schools. And it's amazing that charity. And if you go meet the, I don't know if you met the owner of that charity, the guy who started it, uh, Magnus McFarlane Barrow. No, no. That's the great charity. You should go and see him one day and go and visit, pay him a visit. Uh, and uh, see what he does. And so I knew that there was nothing coming out of that charity. There was nobody in flashcards, there was nobody in big salaries. Yeah. At the time, Magnus was in himself at 20,000 a year, I think. Yeah. And he always travelled the economy. And he's like six foot six. Yeah. <laughs> so he got the African economy to, to visit the, the, the schools that he was building at the time. Mm. And then the schools that he's feeding. Um, yeah, so every, every and, and Operation Smile, uh, uh, they told me how much it would cost to, do, to fund the whole mission. And I knew and and the value there was fantastic. Yeah. It cost less than a thousand pounds to change a whole family's life by doing the operation. Because yeah. mm -hmm. what I pay for is, is the, the surgeons. Um, hotel accommodation and the food and things when they're there and right. the travelling expenses. Right, yeah. yeah. But nobody, get, nobody gets paid otherwise. No. Duncan, listen, thank you very much. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Nice Be you. Beautiful, beautiful home and uh, we'll see you tomorrow night. We caught up with Graham and Leanne to find out what they thought of the conversation. I think the one thing really I took away today which, which resonates with us well, certainly, uh, you know, has, has been the, there is no magic formula no, to this. No, uh, there is not one thing. There is, it's hard, hard work. work. And and, it's, and I think a lot of people underestimate mm -hmm. it's 24-7. Mm -hmm. Hard work and commitment. Yeah, and desire mm -hmm. and just keeping at it. Mm -hmm. So when, uh, when things get tough, when everything's going wrong, mm -hmm. that's the time when you double down on your efforts and get going. So... Like Duncan said, when they done the when the COVID lockdown, there's nothing else for it other than right. We need to roll our sleeves up and deal with it, mm -hmm. and just get cracked on. And uh, ultimately, I think that's probably one of the biggest lessons for me, not just for the, for the pandemic situation, but for every tough, challenging uh, situation. You know, we're dealt with different different issues or different scenarios every day. But as an entrepreneur, we love finding the solution and, yeah. and making it work. And, and that's all done through hard graft. Good, no, so I uh, thoroughly enjoyed it and uh, hopefully, well, we'll Going see him again. We'll see, see him tomorrow, him tomorrow night. Tomorrow. Mm -hmm. That's it for this episode, but tune in next time to Business Success with Graham and Leanne Carling.